waiting for Facebook, right? Okay, we're now on Facebook. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to our new Thursday schedule. This is the beginning of our fourth year, and we will have a um, some swearing in of uh, new um, council members and alternates. And um, let's get started. Um, Cindy, would you like to have, call the, for the pledge? So we'll start. Uh, I'll wait for my flag here. <laughs> here it comes. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the Republic. Republic for which it stands, which stands one, nation one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible with, liberty with liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. Thank you. Okay, now we'll move on to the uh, roll call and I'm gonna call both the, um, the MAC reps and the alternates. So, uh, Beth. I'm here, here. Oh, okay, um, Che. It's not here tonight. Okay. Uh, Scott, we know you're here. Annie? She'll be on later. Okay, great. Uh, Marty? Uh, here. Okay, Paul? Here. Ann Yeager? Abby? I see you there. Here. Hey, Wanda? Yeah. I know she's there. And Carolyn? Okay. Oh, there's Wanda. Okay, welcome. Uh, Jill? I know you're on mute, but I see you. Okay, well, we know you're there. <laughs> uh, and oh, Ann just joined. Okay, thank you. And uh, Liz Gallagher, is she here tonight? Up right now. Uh, Liz Gallagher and Ann Yeager are in the uh, attendees. Thank okay. You for in. We've already sworn in. Okay. Oh, no, Ann's come in. Okay. <laughs> um, and Brian, I see you there. Carl, is he might be in the attendees? I don't see. No, I don't see him. Okay. See Carl. Oh, and I, I'm sorry, I forgot uh, Ginny Nichols. There we go. Welcome. Okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> oh. So now do you want me to move on, Scott, right to the... Um, the adoption of the new council members and leadership. And I will turn it over to Leo to um, swear, swear everyone in. Thanks so much. Um, I am deputized to swear in the new council members today. Um, Linda uh, had something come up that conflicts with this time, but she'll join later in the meeting. So I get to do this privilege. I'm referencing the agenda and I see that I'm supposed to be swearing in um, Caroline Madden, Jill Lippett. Ginny Nichols and Carl Osier. I know that we didn't see Carl earlier. Is everybody else here? And is it um, at least, I'm, I'm assuming it's okay if we just proceed and then uh, since Carl's an alternate, you don't need him for quorum, right? Right. Okay, great. So I'll go ahead and read the oath of office. Um, when I say um, your name, don't say your name to repeat, say your actual name if you're being sworn in. Um, with that, um, let's, uh, I guess, may I ask uh, Carolyn, Jill, and Ginny to go ahead and unmute, and then I'll go ahead and read and you can respond. Hopefully that will work without too much chaos. Okay, great. Um, so repeat after me, I, your name, do solemnly swear or affirm. I, Jill Lippett, do solemnly swear, or solemnly swear and affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution. That I will support and defend, and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. Of the United States and the State of California and the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against, against all, all enemies, enemies that I will bear true faith and allegiance, that I will bear true faith and allegiance 
to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. To the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of California. The State of California. That I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. That I take this freely without any reservation and reservation and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Congratulations, you're all set, and I'm really thrilled to have you all on board. Thanks for joining. Thank, Thank you. you. I see Carl is here now. Oh. Uh, so. Where is he? Well, oh, can, um, your Elise, call. should we go ahead and do Carl right now? Yeah, Your I call. think we might as well get it all done. All right, Carl, um, I'm glad that you were able to um, get onto the panel. Um, go ahead and unmute. I'm doing the oath of office right now. So I'll go ahead and um, read and then you can repeat back to me. Um, does that sound good? Are you ready? Yeah, sure. Just getting else set up here. How's it going? Wonderful. Okay, so Thank you. Thanks for swearing in. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I, I'm, I've been awake for 17 hours of flying, so I'm, uh -oh. yeah, my apologies. Well, thanks for being here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump in, so just repeat after me. Um, I, Carl Osier, do solemnly swear or affirm. I do, Carl Osier, do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true allegiance and faith to the Constitution. I will bear true allegiance and faith to the Constitution. Of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. Of the United States and of the Constitution of state of california that i take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion i take this obligation freely <laughs> without, any, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion and that i will well and faithfully discharge i will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which i am about to enter the duties upon which I'm about to enter. You're all set. Thank you so much. Congratulations. No problem. I'm Thank sorry you. for being late. It's okay. No um, and um, Beth and Che are swapping positions. Do we need to do anything other than just announce it? Uh, not Beth? today. At the okay. Moment. Not today. But I, I would like to take a minute um, in between bringing in the new and, and doing the election of the chair and the vice chair to express my depth of appreciation for your two years as chair, Scott. You have been a fantastic leader. You have dedicated almost full time to this community. You have um, brought up great ideas and supported your community in ways I hadn't even realized could come about. So uh, I just want to take a moment from all of us to express our deep appreciation. And, and we're so glad to know that you still have another year so that even if you won't be chair in the future, at least you'll still be there to guide and support us all as we, as we keep going on this, on this mission. So thank you very, very much. Thank you for saying uh, it. Two years. <laughs> two years, yes, two years. Okay, and um, uh, thank you. Okay, so, so we'll move. I'm sorry, did someone? Uh, I'll just say that um, Cindy's going to um, do the nom uh, nomination process and carry us through um, selection of new chair and vice chair. Cindy. Okay, thanks. So we'll start with the nomination of the chair. Uh, currently, uh, Marty Campbell is nominated. Uh, are there any other members who want to be considered? Raise your hand. Yeah, sorry, raise your hand if you do. <laughs> Not seeing. Okay. okay. 
Um, so I'm, I'm thinking, Scott, we should, um, we'll vote on this to confirm the, um, confirm her new, uh, being the new chair, uh, chairperson. So I'll have two separate votes, one for the, the um, vice chair and one for the chair. Does that work? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to go do a, do a roll call here. Uh, I'll move that oh, we sorry. Uh, do so vote. Any second? I second the motion. Okay. So just a minute, Scott. Okay. So um, Beth? Oh, I approve. Thank you. Uh, Scott? Uh, yes. Marty? Yes. Paul? Yes. Abby? Yes. Wanda? Yes. Jill? Yes. Brian? Jenny? Yes. And um, okay, so um, uh, welcome Marty as the, uh, the new chair and then as the vice chair, uh, Brian Lubitz is, um, is the nomination and I will ask again, are there any other members who want to be considered? And raise your hand. Okay, do I have a motion? So moved. Oh. I I'm second. Second. Okay, who was the, the motion? Paul. Paul. Oh, got it, thank you. And Marty seconded. Okay, Sec here. Okay, so I'm gonna do another roll call here. So Beth? I approve. Scott? Yes. Marty? Yes. Paul? Yes. Abby? Yes. Wanda? Yes. Jill? Yes. Brian? Yes. And Ginny? Yes. Okay, so we have confirmed our new uh, chair and vice chair, so. Congratulations to both of you. Marty, the meeting Thank is you. yours. Yes. Okay, thank you, Scott. And thank you, Scott, so much for your leadership the last two years. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda as submitted? Um, like with to, um, one like change. To, yeah. Sorry, Go you ahead. got it. You got uh, it, Scott. To move Linda later in the agenda as she will um, close to the staff, we think, but she will come later. That's a change in the agenda. Is okay. So with that change, do I have the uh, motion to approve the agenda? I'll move. I'll second the motion. And that was breath, right? Second? Yes. Okay. Yes. So Cindy, do I do the roll call or do you? Um, I usually do, but. Okay, great. Okay, if you wanna make a change, I'm fine with that. No, that's okay. fine. I'm trained by Scott, remember. Yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, we'll uh, start again, and you can just say aye. So we'll start Beth. Aye. Scott. Aye. Marty. Aye. Paul. Aye. Abby. Aye. Wanda. Aye. Jill. Aye. Brian. Aye. And Ginny. Aye. Okay. So it's uh, it's um, approved. Okay. Um, are there any statements of conflict of interest from council members? Seeing no hands, um, at least do we need a motion for this? In the past, we've just asked there was no motion. Right, okay. Correct. Um, correspondence. I didn't see any correspondence in the agenda packet. Is there any correspondence for the meeting? No. Okay. Uh, the consent calendar is composed of the approval of the minutes of the November 17th, 2021 um, meeting. Do I have a motion uh, to approve the minutes? I, I might ask, are there any changes or corrections, sir? Okay. Any so changes moved. or correction, Paul? No, so moved. Okay, second. Second. Second is Scott. Okay. Okay. I'll go ahead and uh, do the roll call again. Uh, Beth. Aye. 
Scott. Aye. Marty. Aye. Paul. Aye. Abby. Aye. Wanda. Aye. Jill. Aye. Brian. Aye. And Jenny. Aye. Okay, approved. Okay, thank you. Um, this is the section for uh, comments from the public regarding uh, matters of general interest that are not on the agenda, but are related to the Sonoma County MAC business. Uh, do any members of the public either on the Zoom call or on Facebook um, have any comments that you'd like to make to the MAC? Please, if you do have a comment, please use the raise your hand function and we will promote you. Okay, Chair Campbell, I'm not seeing any hands raised. I do have one comment on Facebook. Um, Damien Bonet states, Scott has been, and I know he will continue to be a champion for our entire region. Oh, oh thanks, Damien. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we actually do have a hand raised for public comment now. C. Higgins. Go ahead, C. Thank you. Thank you, Jason and everyone, and welcome all to the new members. And a big thank you to all the existing members. Um, I am raising my hand because I'm not seeing anyone from the town of Bodega making comment. But uh, I've been seeing a lot of people very concerned about two incidents recently. And it's been based on folks speeding through town on their way to the coast or their way back. First was the general store where the vehicle went directly into the store, really devastated that family. And then yesterday at the other end of town, someone crashed into the beautiful new sign um, and almost, you know, had there not been that barricade there would have gone into another family home. And I know that the people of Bodega are really concerned and maybe not aware that the MAC is a resource for them as some way to get some help from the county to address this issue. Um, this I don't think is a Caltrans issue because it is a county road, but I thought I would bring it to the attention of the MAC and especially the Bodega um, representatives to see if you can work with the community there to find out how they might want to resolve this problem or address this problem before we have something worse than damage to a structure. Thank you. Thank you, C. Beth, will you take that on to follow yeah. up on? Um, we don't get to respond to things said during public oh, comment okay. because they are not on the agenda. So oh, even, though, okay. even though we've been working on it, see, we cannot talk to you about it during this meeting. So public comment is simply they comment and then we move on. Okay, thank you. Um, so moving on to regular calendar items, the, and I assume Linda is still not here. So the first one will be the Timber Cove County Water District micro grid project uh, by Spencer Lip. Spencer, thank you for joining us. And we're all interested in what you have to say. Could I, could I jump in real quick? Uh, Spencer yes. is, I, I won't, don't want to embarrass him, but he is so qualified in this. That I won't even mention what, it, what his um, background is but just know that he's the right man for this and we are so, so lucky. Go ahead, Spencer. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll give a, a little, I guess a little bit of background. Um, um, so I'm on the, the Timber Cove County Water District Board and um, kind of this idea came about um, after my, my career as a mechanical engineer working in, working in energy and distributed energy resources programs for 25 years. Um, and my wife, Renee uh, Fernandez Lip also is in the energy business as well. And we're both on, we're both on the committee to um, determine the feasibility of this project. And, um, and so, you know, this came about um, just as a, as a kind of wild, crazy idea. And, um, excited to show you to show you guys today um, where we're at we still have ways to go 
but um, it's it's looking it's looking promising. So um, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully um, I share the right one when I put this in presentation mode for you. Got it. You're seeing my desktop. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Now you're seeing the presentation. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. So um, we started this this process uh, probably um, a, April or May. Um, so and we have I think a preliminary kind of a preliminary design that we need to work on um, and and further evaluate. So. Um, so just uh, the project goal and, and summary is really to provide some energy resiliency to the community. Um, and that also, that includes all the water district customers as well as the fire department and Fort Ross school. So we included them as, as obviously emergency um, emergency organizations and, and the school as a critical component um, to the community, even though they're not in the water district um, uh, customer base. We, we felt that going up the road, up Timber Cove Road to incorporate those two, those two in, um, structures and, and services would be a great benefit to the, to the community. So um, the there's a, there's a reservoir and the intent is to um, install some floating solar panels on the reservoir. Um, we need to find um, other areas to install ground mount or rooftop, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, uh, pair, the, pair that solar generation with energy storage batteries and a microgrid so that um, when there's power outages, the community then becomes islanded and uh, the power doesn't go out and we're running off um, the batteries and the, and the solar. So that's the project goal and, and summary. Um, if you're, you know, I think everybody probably is aware of, of uh, solar PV, um, but they do, um, they, they can be installed on the water and there's a couple pictures there. Um, they're really just floated on, on those rafts, as you see, and then, and then kind of anchored down into the bottom of the, of the reservoir. And because, you know, because our reservoir um, will go up and down in depth, we need to be a little bit careful to make sure that um, it doesn't go down too far and, and there's enough space um, for, for the, the solar, photovoltaics to um, not get crammed as, as the depth decreases and the surface area of the reservoir um, also decreases. So there's a couple nearby um, projects that have been done, um, Windsor and, and Healdsburg. Um, you can read about them if you're interested. Uh, the internet has a bunch of different stories on, on those ones. Um, the the battery this is these are commercial grade kind of modular batteries each one of those in the picture there those set of five um uh that set of five is is about 250 uh kw it's about the size of a um regular parking parking space that we put our cars in and the whole goal here is of course the photovoltaics generate electricity in the daytime um, you you put that into the into the battery um, any excess that's not used goes into the battery charges the battery and then the battery discharges at night to carry carry the the community through the nighttime um, the islanding um, is kind of an in industrial electrical controls just to you know, make sure that make sure that we're being safe and distributing the electricity through the battery and charging it properly. And there's um, uh, switches that that PG&E helps with to make sure um, that that we're being safe and and not gonna the energy's not gonna dissipate out into the grid and create a hazard 
um, during these power outages. So that's kind of an overview of the, of the concept. I, I didn't want to get too technical there, but wanted to give kind of an overview in case people weren't familiar with some of these concepts. Um, so what, what could this potentially do for, do for us? Well, the, the water district, um, it could be a revenue source for the water district um, as, as a, a place where there's, you know, where, where they're using our, our land and, and, um, and space on the, on the reservoir, um, you'd get a little bit, a little bit of revenue. Um, from, from that aspect. Um, there's a decrease in water evaporation. Some reports talk about up to 70% reduction where the panels cover the water. So of course, as we talk about droughts, uh, you know, any, any time we can um, you know, improve, improve on, on, um, on the, the water availability, um, that's, that's good for us. And because sunlight spurs um, algae growth, it decreases the algae growth, and, and that makes it easier to um, easier to, to process the water. Um, our Timber Cove Water District is for drinking water, so um, we need to make sure that that all that algae and other contaminants is out of there. Um, from the community perspective, one of the things that is is important is. Um, making sure during uh, these PSPS events that um, it's safe to, to have the community electrified. So um, PG&E, which I'm going to touch on a little bit later, has, has a, a program that helps support this and, and hardening some of the lines um, that are at most risk um, during those, uh, those maybe high wind events. Um, so it's a, a fire, a fire, um, uh, a, a, a decrease in fire um, effort for, for that. Um, of course, you know, we want to maintain power um, during these PSP, PS events. Um, they've lasted, you know, they've gotten better, but but in the in the past, um, you know, they've lasted a long time, several days. Um, recently, this year was pretty good. We didn't have that many, um, if any at all. Um, PG&E's gotten a lot better about about um, about you know who they turn off and and how long they're out, but they still are are need to do that to to keep everybody everybody safe. Um, depending on how how we end up funding this, which is one of the questions that we need to work out in the near future. Um, there could be some uh, long-term fixed price uh, energy costs for the community or elimination of time use pricing. Um, and, uh, and of course, with um, all the photovoltaics and, and the batteries, we're, there's gonna be a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from, from not using the, the grid. Um, so, as I mentioned, we have a preliminary design, so um, 40, 462 kW on the floating um, PV plant, and then um, three of those kind of modular um, battery systems that I, that I talked about in the, in the beginning, totaling 750 kW. And we got um, community energy data and did, a, did an analysis um, in order to understand what this design will, will do for us. So we're gonna, this is a, the entire year here, but we're really gonna focus on the PSPS months because that's really what we're trying to, what we're trying to, um, to impact here. Um, certainly there's power outages at other times, of the year, but those are usually, you know, a few hours here, a few hours there. And if we install to combat the PSPS events, then we should take care of the other, um, the other outages that, that happen um, uh, throughout the year. So if we kind of zoom into these PSPS events, the, the pink pattern there is, um, where, where we have uh, complete resiliency. So you see there's a few days when, um, based on the data, 
um, the system wouldn't be able to supply all of all of the um, all of the power to the community. Of course, we would hope and expect um, that during these events, um, the community would curtail some of their some of their power usage, similar to probably how they would do it now if they um, started a generator. So um, you know, so so we would expect some of that to. Um, some of those some of those days to to um, go down and and be within the within the peak period. Um, so here's just kind of rough order of magnitude financials, and we need to work on getting this down a little bit and also finding the funding sources um, because it is still pretty expensive. And the more solar that we can find um, to offset the battery costs and still maintain the same resiliency, it's going to be it's going to be better. So um, that's the total the total project at the moment is three and a half to four million dollars. Um, there is the the PG and E CMET program there. They are offering up to three million in cost for the PG and E equipment upgrades to Island. So that does include that hardening of the lines that I talked about. It also includes a little bit of the, um, the cost within that three and a half to 4 million because it includes the microgrid controllers. So they would, they would pay for that. Um, and so, and, and then some other potential funding sources, there's another CPUC uh, microgrid incentive program. It, it's intended to launch later this year. So we want to investigate what opportunities there are for that. Um, there's also the self-generation incentive program, um, which offers incentives for energy storage. Um, and um, ultimately, that's not going to cover the whole thing. And we're going to have to seek some kind of uh, third party funding. Um, hoping and I don't want to speak out of turn because we haven't talk to them extensively, but hoping that Sonoma Clean Power will be um, supportive of this and, and willing to, to help us and, and put it in their, in their portfolio. So um, next steps is, is really to evaluate for more solar PV potential. Um, I think that the, uh, the, the fire station um, and the, the school have um, some open area that, that we haven't talked to them yet, but it would be interesting to talk to them about. There's also the rim around the, around the, the water reservoir, which we haven't analyzed yet either. So, so with those two things, maybe we could even double the PV potential and, and um, reduce the battery size and then refine the project scope based on that. Um, Again, determine the, the right financial path and financial partners and um, uh, do events like this to, to just work on the community awareness. We um, haven't done a lot of that only because this project, um, just recently we got that feasibility study back from, from the, the um, entity that, that helped us design that. So. Um, we haven't, other than a few meetings at the, at the water district board meeting, we haven't, we haven't done a lot of community awareness on, on this just because it was just too soon and, and we didn't have, um, you know, we, it was just too soon to engage the community, but we're getting closer to that. And uh, that's it. Um, any questions folks might have? I, I do. I have. This is Scott. Um, um, will the um, the current solar that's being collected by your customer base will that add to your um, capacity if people have rooftop um, panels currently, or is that already built into your um, usage? It's it's built in um, with with a caveat. So this. I went back to this chart because, because the lines represent actual usage of the community. And so to the extent that there, there was existing solar 
Um, like for instance, my house in Timber Cove has, has solar. Um, that would already be included in this, um, given that it was, uh, to the extent that it was already installed prior to, prior to this data. Um, and any new solar that, that may have come online um, in the past year, um, potentially that wouldn't be included here um, in this data, but for the most part, existing solar um, should already be included in the data. Okay, and I'd like to ask that panelists who have a question for Spencer, raise their hands so I can be sure to um, call on everybody and I see four hands raised. Did you have another follow-up question, Scott? Yeah, just quick. Um, would the microgrid be the primary supplier of electricity? In other words, pg and is online, but you're producing electricity. Um, you'll provide your electricity before pg and &E, correct? Um, for the most part, yes. Um, you know, once the electricity gets into the gets into the grid, it, it goes, it goes where it wants to, right? But, but we would be providing our electricity on a regular basis into the grid. So, so from all intents and purposes, purposes, yes, but there's, there's no guarantee that those electrons serve the actual community. Um, because once it gets into the grid, in the event that we're not islanded, it can go anywhere in the grid, um, but but you can yeah. you can say that it, it's going to the to the community in a sense. Got it. Thank you. Okay, I did not see who raised their hand first, so I'm going to go in the order that I see the names on my um, sidebar. So Elise. Thank you, Marty. Spencer, I just wanted to ask, Occidental was working on a microgrid project and um, there were a whole lot of unexpected regulations that they ran into that the CPC had approved. You know, things like um, they wanted to put solar panels on one side of the street and, and connect the grid into the next side of the street. And there's apparently a rule that you cannot have a grid cross streets. So a microgrid cross streets. So, are, are you running into regulations that are um, problematic or are PG&E and CPC working well in terms of supporting the project? Yeah, I'm not familiar with that Occidental issue. Um, I'm wondering if it was if it was a few years ago or something. Um, we've had, Renee and I have had several conversations with PG&E on this project um, to start that CMEP program. Um, application and, and get involved there. They haven't mentioned, they're fully aware of the scope of this and have not mentioned anything about any regulatory issues crossing streets. Um, so I, I, I don't know, I don't know the specifics of that Occidental, but um, so far, um, you know, I would, I would expect them to know that. I mean, the, the program is a microgrid program, so I hope they know that, but um, so far so good on that front. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, uh, Paul Plakos. Thank you. Uh, uh, Spencer, I've got uh, several questions. First of all, I wanna say this is just fascinating stuff. So th thanks for presenting this today. Um, the, uh, the energy that you would not be using to um, store into the batteries which is, it sounds like your primary purpose is so that you have it during PSPS. Uh, so you can put that energy back into the grid and um, would someone be compensated for that or would it offset some energy costs? So, so that's, where, that's where the funding and somebody such as Sonoma Clean Power becomes such a key partner because they are looking to purchase those green, those green electrons. And, and um, so they could conceivably set up a, um, set up a contract with, with the installer of this, um, of this system such that, you know, they purchase that electricity from that, that installer um, and maintainer, 
And then the community gets the benefit of the microgrid, microgrid component. Um, if we start getting into some other kind of community funding um, to where, you know, we're um, taking advantage of the different time of use and, and that kind of um, load management operation or cost um, cost management operation, it, it, it starts to get tricky in terms of how we pay for it and how we get reimbursed from it from a water district standpoint. Um, so I think our first, our first shot is to try to find somebody willing, willing to pay for those electrons and provide the community the benefit, um, you know, that we're looking for. Okay, I, I kind of ask it because at Sea Ranch, uh, the association itself uh, uses a lot of energy, and so um, we might find some benefit there. And we have a very, very large reservoir. I really like the the potential of decreasing evaporation by up to seventy percent. I mean, that's uh, that that would be, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's in some studies and and as an engineer you know i gotta i gotta try to dig into the numbers and i i haven't i haven't been able to um <laughs> to to uh verify verify that so that's maybe that should have been with an asterisk in my uh in my presentation as an okay. engineer well i'll take 50 percent <laughs> <laughs> um the is the cost of these floating panels less than um the cost of panels that you would fix on the ground. It, it's actually pretty comparable because because the infrastructure and the, the ground mount has a lot of steel and and um, structure structural um, mm -hmm. components to it. And so it's actually pretty comparable um, to the cost for for ground mount. The efficiency of the panels actually increases a little bit because of the cooling from the water um, than ground mount or rooftop. Okay, well, thank you so much. Okay, Beth Bruzzoni. Hello, uh, Spencer, I, I have to echo what Paul just said. This is absolutely fascinating. Um, very intriguing project. I have a, a question regarding wildlife. Um, given the size of the panels, given where they're going, is there an anticipated impact on in particularly birds? We haven't considered that. Um, you know, if they're if they're on the on the reservoir, I, I don't know what kind of bird activity we actually get there. Um, but you know, that's a great question that, that we're gonna have to that we're that we should investigate. Um, we hadn't considered that in this in the early stages, but that's a that's a great question. Thank you, thank you. One other quick question. Um, my audio broke up a little bit and I don't know whether or not you mentioned whether this project would have employees. Um, will there be jobs created by this project going in? Um, not after the project's installed. I, I wouldn't expect any, any real um, uh, labor, labor impacts. Um, it pretty much, you know, runs runs seamlessly or from a remote standpoint. Um, of course, the water district does have operators on staff that can, you know, jump in and and you know take a look at something if need be. But it doesn't require any, you know, continual um, uh, labor in order to in order to make sure it's operating properly. Okay, thank you. Okay, and um, my hand was next. And um, Spencer, thank you very much for coming to tell us about this project. And I was wondering whether the energy that's produced, uh, whether you're intending to use it for the ongoing operation for your water district, uh, during the PSPS for the water district operation itself, or whether you're looking at it um, 
to address the needs of other community members than uh, the water district? Yeah, so um, it's the entire water district um, customers. Um, so the water district plant that, that treats the water is included within, within the scope. Um, but um, we have about 180 customers, um, including the Timber Cove Inn. Um, so, so the Timber Cove Inn would be included, and then all the all the houses within the within the community. And then again, we're going up the up Timber Cove Road to the to the fire station and Fort Ross School. Um, anybody that happens to not be a, a water district co customer, um, you know, they'd also be included. There may be a couple, couple other houses, you know, along there that, that would be included um, just, by, just by chance. But really the benefit is trying to get up in the emergency response of the fire district and, you know, keeping the, keeping the electricity on for the kids at the schools and having a place for the community to meet and if we need to go congregate somewhere. Um, that's the that's what you know the the benefit of the school. Okay. Are there any other panelists who have questions before we move to the public? Okay. Um, are there uh, can the people, the attendees in the public are they able to raise their hands if they have a question, Elise or Jason? Yes, um, attendees, if you if you would like to uh, comment, um, please uh, use the raise your hand function. I don't see anyone. I don't see anyone, and um, I will read one comment from Facebook um, from Alan Taylor Poff. Um, who says county always has made permitting such work very difficult. Well, Spencer, you have your work cut out for you. Yes, yes, we, we are aware <laughs> of that for sure. Okay. So. Well, thank you very much. Does anybody have any last questions for Spencer? Just thank, thank you. you much Spencer this is um, a dream come true and and uh, you know, I, I'm so excited to see this happen and uh, wait to see it finish thank you I, I hope we can make it happen I, I you know we've made some progress but um, you know as as always in a project like this there's a lot of a lot of um, work and and partners to get engaged and uh, to make it happen and, and things, things to consider that we haven't thought about, like, like um, you know, like the wildlife uh, that was brought up today. So I'm sure things will come up and, and we'll do our best to overcome them and, and make it happen. But um, yeah, thanks for allowing, allowing um, uh, me to present and um, uh, Renee's in the, in the, um, in the audience, in the in the guests, um, so I'll, I'll just thank thank um, you for her as well. Um, so we're we're just excited to present it and uh, present where we're at. Did Wanda? Thank you. Yeah, just hmm. yeah, real quick. Um, where are you hoping to get your funding from? Well, our first shot is Sonoma Clean Power, um, who, you know, they, they have a, an initiative to um, go 100% um, renewable. Um, so that would be our first, our first shot. It's obviously within, within their district. Um, they know of the project, um, but we haven't had any serious discussions with them around, around this. We just got you know, kind of this feasibility and this rough order magnitude cost um, just, um, you know, uh, actually last week. So, um, so yeah, so once we have a, maybe a, a better idea of, of what the project really is gonna look like and investigate those different um, areas where we can enhance the project with, with more solar, I think that would be the time to take a to take a you know a better 
um, a, a better project design to somebody like Sonoma Clean Power, um, you know, for their consideration. But they would be the number one on the list. Okay, uh, great. In my yeah. opinion. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, uh, Jenny Nichols. Jenny, do you have a question? I think you're muted. Jenny. Sorry about that. I forgot to unmute myself. Um, thank you for presenting this most unusual and creative idea for the use of solar for uh, backup. And I just am very curious about how long did it take, given your professional background, for you to reach this stage? Um, well, we, we kind of um, uh, started thinking about the idea in, in February of last year and but really started working on it around May which was when we submitted the application to PG&E for that for that CMET program um, getting them to uh, be able to provide us the data um, there there's some um, data security things that we needed to work out um, you know they they just don't give anybody data right it's it's confidential stuff and so we needed to work through all of those issues to to get the data um took took quite some time to get you know to get them satisfied with um uh, get the proper signatures and proper authorizations for them to give us the data um we got the data probably in in november-ish and um been working with um, a microgrid designer, you know, kind of since then and kind of honing, honing this in a little bit. And of course the holidays come and, you know, things slow down a little bit, but that's kind of the overall, I, I had hoped to be, to have this kind of preliminary design, um, several months ago, but, you know, we're, we're at where we're at and, um, you know, we'll continue to trudge forward. Well, I think it's a remarkable progress. It, from what I understood you to say, it's less than a year. You've been able to work with PG&E, get the data, do the sort of the overall high-level design. That's impressive. Congratulations, and we'll keep our fingers crossed that uh, it will be maybe become a model for other communities. I think it. I think it could be, um, especially you know, especially if we if we get there. There's lots of little water districts um, all over the place, and or reservoirs, or you know, wineries, or you know, and and the floating, you know, it just takes up it. It takes advantage of otherwise unused unused area for you know to to create some some green electricity. So. Um, I think it's very innovative, so great. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Spencer. Um, the next item on our agenda is uh, to hear about proposed changes in special events permitting from Bradley Dunn, from, who joins us from Permit Sonoma. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be sharing my screen and uh, presentation. Can folks see it? Yes. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Bradley Dunn, and I am uh, the policy manager at Permit Sonoma. Uh, my work includes um, cross-divisional policy formation, um, like the special events uh, permitting reform project. Um, outreach engagement and communications. And uh, I am really glad to get to share with you uh, the work that we've done to address our, uh, the permitting um, of special events in the county. Um, so we have a couple key project goals. Um, the first is to make uh, events in the public right of way safer. The second is to improve community events calendar so that planners can minimize conflicts. Um, the third is to make events more sustainable with waste diversion requirements and enhance intergovernmental communication and collaboration. 
Um, so for a little background, um, special events uh, are something that is really important to Sonoma County. Um, we have a lot of them um, from 2016 to 2019 uh, before the pandemic um, prevented a lot of these special events. Um, we permitted an average of 55 events throughout the county um, uh, in the right of way. Uh, we had 108 special events on private property through the fire marshal um, that were permitted. And among those events were seven athletic events with more than 2,500 participants. Um, these events um, can be anything from the Sebastopol Farmers Market um, to, uh, you know, from farmers markets to, um, you know, uh, the Iron Man. Um, the Economic Development Board uh, did a study of the 2017 Iron Man and showed that it added. Um, about $2.7 million of indirect spending to the County of Sonoma. So, you know, um, that's uh, hotels that are booked, uh, that's restaurants that serve uh, participants, um, coffee shops, uh, those kinds of things. Um, it's people that come up for the, the weekend and, and spend, uh, you know, for the event and spend the whole weekend um, getting to know our county better. Um, and it's also, you know, cultural events. Uh, things like, uh, you know, uh, Fourth of July parades. So it's a wide variety of events um, that we uh, need to look at. Um, you know, these events regulations haven't been updated uh, since 1994. Uh, the county's grown by about 25% since 1994. Um, we have a greater demand for our shared spaces uh, than ever before. So we're looking at ways that we can um, you know, make sure that special events are more harmonious with the communities that host them. So the first thing that we're looking at doing is making events in the right of way safer. Um, currently, uh, special, the special events ordinance has an exemption for bicycling events that obey the California Vehicle Code. Um, we have heard a lot of concern about large bicycle events um, using this provision uh, to uh, host their events uh, without getting a permit. Uh, we know that unpermitted events prevent collaboration with law enforcement and first responders to protect the public. Um, and permitting also allows agencies, especially um, you know, fire districts out in the coast uh, to recover their costs. Uh, uh, so um, we think that uh, it's really important that more events are permitted. So we are looking at capturing more events in the permitting process um, by making changes to uh, the way bicycling events are permitted. So we're looking at thresholds for being able to do so. Um, the first, uh, you know, we don't want um, things like, hey, me and my buddies are gonna get together and we're gonna go on a bike ride, um, you know, kind of green transportation, uh, people commuting, like those kinds of things to be caught up in this process. Uh, we are looking to permit large events um, that are, uh, you know, organized uh, for profit and, um, you know, many of these events uh, do do fundraising and are related to nonprofits, but, um, you know, where participants pay to participate. So um, some of the potential things that we're considering um, are requiring any event that has a timed component or awards a winner to get a permit, um, applying the current 50 person limit or some person limit um, for other events to cycling. Um, we've heard extensively from the cycling community that 50 people is uh, too low of a limit. Um, and, you know, that that would capture things like regular club rides, um, you know, kind of group rides that are not for profit, that are just friends coming together, safety classes from, you know, some of the county's larger cycling organizations. Um, and those kinds of things. So we're really looking at about a 250 person limit. We think that that is um, a good sweet spot based on our outreach so far. Um, and then requiring uh, that all events that participants pay for are permitted uh, and or some combination of these restrictions uh, so that people aren't trying to um, kind of game the restrictions. Uh, as you can see here, um, we really think that making sure that, um, you know, we have the, the events that uh, are, are 
produced are kind of generating, in, you know, are generating revenue um, and are larger being permitted is, is really our goal here. Um, we think that capturing that is going in our permitting process is going to be really important for um, making sure that uh, we are, um, you know, make, uh, doing the coordination that's necessary, that fire districts, um, you know, for example, and um, CHP and others um, are aware of these kinds of events. Um, and so that, you know, that it also allows for collaboration with neighbors, um, making sure that folks are aware of things. Um, you know, if, if, if they're not telling us, we can't help make sure the community knows about those events. And that kind of leads to our next um, idea and uh, next goal, which is uh, to improve uh, the community event calendar uh, to minimize conflicts. So the special event calendar uh, currently exists and provides a centralized repository for special events, um, but it's not great. And one of the reasons why it's not great is a large number of events avoid permitting and therefore don't go on the calendar because they're not working with us and partners in order to, um, you know, because they uh, are exempt from permit restrictions. So we think that um, by permitting a greater percentage of events, it makes the calendar a lot more effective. Um, that helps people in the community know what's going on. Um, you know, if you know about an event, you can make plans and, and um, make adjustments to your schedule um, so that you aren't stuck behind an event or you know blocked off or have any of those kinds of challenges that if you don't know about an event can be really frustrating and aggravating. Um, so by permitting a greater percentage of events, by requiring um, cycling events to uh, uh, be permitted, we think that that will make the calendar more effective. The second thing that we think uh, can make the calendar more effective is having a longer term um, outlook for the calendar and encouraging um, events like 4th of July parades that are on the same route every year, the same weekend, to get multi-year permits. Currently, the legislation only allows for permits to be issued um, one calendar year before. And so what we're looking at is a way to um, have promoters of events reserve a date for multiple years. Um, we're thinking potentially even uh, up to five years where um, that would go on a calendar. So people would be able to get used to the idea that, you know, um, just like Pride is uh, in you know the last weekend in June every year, um, that uh, we have a um, you know there's going to be a cycling event um, you know the first weekend of May um, you know it's going to be uh, you know the Santa Rosa Cycling Club's big event um, so people would actually you know know about that we think that, that would also um, privilege local um, event organizations um, in so that. You know, folks coming into the county from outside the county uh, would have to work around local organizations that, you know, typically, um, you know, have the same event every year. Uh, but we think that that would also help, you know, uh, continue those kinds of communicative relationships um, with the, um, you know, with different entities. Uh, we are also, in addition to our ordinance reforms, uh, we are also looking at ways that we can better um, have communication with the public. So we're going to be doing process reforms that include um, district-specific email lists for having uh, for when special events happen, so that um, you can get an email about every you know um, about every event that's happening in District Five. Um, you know uh, that month, and you'll get a monthly email. So having those kinds of things will hopefully make the calendar more effective and useful for members of the community. The second thing that, uh, the third thing that we're looking at doing is making um, events more sustainable with waste diversion requirements. Um, so we know that Sonoma County has long been a leader in environmental sustainability, but unfortunately many other areas have surpassed us when it comes to events. Uh, requiring waste diversion um, in their events to help keep, uh, you know, uh, waste out of the landfill um, to encourage recycling and encourage composting. Um, so we're working with uh, Zero Waste Sonoma, uh, which is Sonoma County's waste 
uh, management agency to implement um, some zero waste best practices. Uh, we're also working with them to make sure that we're aligning requirements with um, you know, municipalities uh, with the overall county approach so that you know, because many of these events cross county and um, in, you know, jurisdictional lines with cities, uh, we want to make sure that um, this is a low burden for as, as possible for event promoters. We are just looking for the environmental benefits, not a lot of extra paperwork. Um, so we're really looking at ways that we can um, make sure that not only are we working with cities, um, but we're also allowing for these uh, requirements to be updated far more frequently than, um, you know, 1994 was the last time these permit requirements were updated. Uh, environmental regulations have come a long way. Um, so we're looking at different ways in the ordinance that we can continue to push, you know, these events to be green leaders and really kind of recapture um, Sonoma County's standing as an environmental leader when it comes to special events. Next, um, and our fourth goal is really to enhance intergovernmental communication and collaboration. So Permit Sonoma is considering implementing a multi-departmental and agency standing committee to create best practices and standards um, for these events and to apply them to permitting. Um, other jurisdictions have committees like this, uh, Seattle, Milwaukee, Seattle, uh, San Francisco, um, all have kind of this kind of structure. And when talking with their staffs, um, we've heard really good things about the enhanced collaboration. Our goal is really that, um, you know, an uh, applicant would be able to come to uh, this committee and hear from everybody that needs to touch their permit, uh, whether that's CHP, the sheriff's office, uh, you know, the local fire district, um, Permit Sonoma, Transportation and Public Works, and we'd be able to be much more collaborative with them. Um, to address concerns from past events, um, to you know, modify routes for construction and other hazards, um, and to be thinking um, you know, kind of proactively about how we can make these events as unobtrusive as possible. Uh, and then you know, we did a survey uh, with 2019 permit holders, and 100% of the survey respondents that we uh, heard back from said that this kind of committee would either be helpful or very helpful. So um, that's kind of the overview of our, um, our, our, our goals and our kind of uh, four main thrusts. Um, our next, oops, our next steps. Um, so uh, community engagement is, uh, this is uh, one of the, the later uh, aspects of community engagement uh, through quarter four of 2021. Uh, we're currently still working on um, our accompanying internal process improvements like those email lists, like making changes to make it easier for people to apply for these permits and make it easier for our staff to handle these permits quickly and thereby reduce permit costs. Um, we're going to be drafting the ordinance um, and going through the review process uh, this quarter and then going to the planning commission um, in quarter two of 2022. Uh, and then the Board of Supervisors in late 2022. Those are our estimates. Um, but we have some questions that we really appreciate hearing your feedback on. Um, first, uh, you know, what, uh, which bicycle events threshold for permits should be implemented? How should we be thinking about what is, um, you know, something that we shouldn't capture, that we shouldn't regulate under this process, and what is something that we should? Um, how long in advance should an applicant be able to reserve dates? Um, should there be additional requirements to secure uh, multiple dates through a reservation process? Um, besides waste diversion, are there any other environmental regulations that Permit Sonoma should consider um, imposing on event producers? Um, do we have any guidance on the operation or formation of the Intergovernmental Committee? Um, or are there additional areas that Permit Sonoma uh, should uh, consider? Um, so we'd really love your feedback and uh, We'll love to hear any thoughts that you have on the process. Okay, Bradley, thank you very much for this presentation. And I, uh, before we open it up to comments, um, we have a land use ad hoc committee. Uh, that's a um, committee, of, a standing committee of 
uh, several of our members. And what is your time frame for getting a coordinated um, answer to questions like this from us to fit into your schedule? Yeah, I mean, we uh, would love if um, you guys can give us feedback by February. Um, we're really trying to work on the language for the ordinance in the next couple months. Um, so feedback uh, sooner rather than later would be um, really helpful for, for us in this process. So, so Brian Lubitz is the, the chair of that land use committee. Um, Brian, do you, uh, how do, would you like to handle this? Would you like to hear from as many people as we can today and then decide whether you wanna have a meeting of your committees to wrap it all up? Right, well, um, first of all, I, I think, just from our perspective, uh, trying to handle um, the uh, the permits that come in, and then having to, you know, what we've been, you know, the 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 delay has been considerable, and that we we get it like four days before it goes forward for anything else. So I think the longer we can get people to submit these ahead of time would be helpful, so people can know about it. People. You know, we could tell folks and the community would have a better chance to, to understand that. So I think that's helpful. In terms of um, the land use committee putting in some comments for that, um, I, I think we could, um, if, to get that before February, um, or we have a, a meeting coming up in mid-February. Um, I'm not sure when you would need comments from us, but we could- Before certainly... the end of February would be, would be great. So a mid-February meeting. And one thing that I do want to just clarify um, about these permits, you know, these permits are currently ministerial. So, you know, we have to apply consistent, um, you know, there isn't a judgment factor in this process. Um, and that's not currently something that we are looking at overturning. So it is about applying consistent, um, you know, consistent rules to um, these permits that come in and wouldn't necessarily be subject to, you know, going through, a, you know, a, a process that you were talking about, about, you know, not getting the permit soon enough. We wouldn't send it through, a uh, you know, a, a process where it goes to a MAC and then goes to planning commission because these are ministerial permits. Right. Okay, thank you. Brian, do you have any other comments? And you can raise your hand again later if you would like to. I, I, will, I will do that later. Okay. Um, uh, Scott Farmer. Hi. Um, some of these notes I made could maybe wait until our February meeting, but you mentioned that fire districts can recover costs. And that's been an issue in some of the permits that I've seen is that, um, they say they're providing an EMT follow-up, but there's no um, no compensation for the local fire districts. Um, and I was wondering if you could comment as to if that's standard or how does that happen that they would get it? So um, one of the things that I would say is, you know, a lot of the challenges with these kinds of issues occur with um, events that don't currently uh, get permits. So we are hopeful that by having them go through the process to get permits and having fire department, um, you know, through a set of standards be there and trigger, you know, um, uh, you know, trigger a level of, of service um, that then those services could re potentially recover costs. Um, so that's something that we're gonna work on with the intergovernmental committee and the fire districts. Uh, in, you know, I had a meeting with the fire chiefs of the district, you know, the district's meeting, um, and they expressed similar concern. And so we are working with them to make sure that, um, you know, with especially these larger events that are for profit, that they are able to recover their costs um, that they do for staging, um, you know, and, you know, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, these events contract with fire districts, sometimes they contract with 
you know, AMR or other, you know, kind of medical services. Um, so, you know, understanding when they're, you know, who's providing the service, um, if there is an emergency, a medical emergency, um, and getting those routed to the people that are supposed to be providing the service. If AMR is contracted to provide the ambulance service, that the call goes to AMR and doesn't go to the local fire district um, is, is something that we're going to be working on. Okay, I'll save my, the rest of them for our February meeting and then get them to you that way, not use the time here. Thank you. Okay, um, Beth? Hello. Uh, first, uh, Bradley, I want to thank you for, for taking this job on. It's, it's a, a really big deal what you're doing, and we're all very appreciative of it. Um, I have a couple of, of relatively quick questions. One of, one of the items you mentioned was the cycling uh, uh, permits, uh, they, they would have to agree to obey all the vehicle codes. Um, how is that enforced with, with these type of permits? So currently, um, CHP enforces the vehicle code. So um, for a permit that is, so for an organization that says that they are, you know, that they're obeying the rules of the road, the California vehicle code, um, CHP would have to cite them um, for violations of the vehicle code. If CHP cited them for violations of the vehicle code, then we could go back and cite them through our code enforcement or our, um, for violations of, of the permit rules if they're not obeying the California vehicle code. Obviously, that's a really kind of um, Byzantine uh, uh, approach to enforcement. And one of the reasons why we're looking at reforming the process so that it's very clear that these large cycling events need to get a permit in the first place. Um, and that, you know, once folks, you know, work with us and work with CHP and work with TPW, um, we think that there's going to be a larger, um, you know, greater cooperation, um, you know, with, with everybody involved. Um, rather than a, a group that's doing things out there on their own without talking to us, without working with CHP. Okay, thank you. And, and one other um, really quick question. You mentioned that these are all ministerial permits. Um, there's quite a bit of debate on that, uh, on the coast. Um, I believe, are, you're, are you relatively new to PRMD? Yeah, so I took this job uh, a little less than a year ago, but you know, pandemic-wise, you don't get around as much. Um, so uh, you know, yeah, uh, I've been working there for uh, my anniversary is in two weeks. So oh, congratulations! Thank, Thank you. you. So, um, what would then, in your opinion, trigger a ministerial permit for for say uh, an event, whether it's cycling or otherwise, on the coast? At what point would a ministerial permit trigger a coastal development permit instead? So we've met with the Coastal Development Commission and um, they have told us that uh, they have a very limited view of what kind of events would trigger a coastal development um, permit. So uh, there is a 1997 memo um, that is the basis of their regulation of coastal events which says basically that from Memorial Day to Labor Day, if you have an event on the sand of a beach, um, it could require a coastal development permit. Uh, that has been interpreted in Sonoma County one time to trigger a coastal development permit um, around a marathon that completely closed basically you know, 26 miles of beach access, um, which during the summer, uh, during those months, and the Coastal Commission stepped in. Um, we have talked with them um, extensively, and they don't have a standardized um, definition for what they consider to be a significant closure that would trigger a Coastal Development Commission. Uh, it's kind of like uh, the legal definition of pornography. They know it when they see it. Um, and so they would prefer that we handle the process through our local um, through our local measures. So, um, because we are, uh, you know, we'll be restricting uh, permits uh, further than what we currently do. Um, the Coastal Development uh, 
commission wouldn't weigh in on this process is our understanding based on our conversations with them. Well, thank you very much. That was a, a thorough explanation. I, I very much appreciated that. You're welcome. It's, uh, it's, it's fun to read that 1997 memo. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's very specific to like a very um, esoteric set of circumstances. So if I reached out to you, would I be able to get a copy of that memo? Yeah, definitely. Um, Excellent. Please Thank send me so an email. Much. It's uh, Bradley, B-R-A-D-L-E-Y dot Dunn, D-U-N-N at cinema-county.org. Thank you so much, Bradley. And, and uh, it's a pleasure to see somebody working on this. Thank you, Wanda. Okay, hi, thank you. Um, I was just wondering um, if there's anything in place um, if an event is scheduled and that day becomes either a red flag warning or there's active fire in the general vicinity. We were very lucky this last year, we didn't have any fires locally really, but of course um, that has not been the case over the past five, six years. So uh, just wondering if there's any um, way you, know, you could draw back a permit or if there's something um, you know, that's established or that you're planning to. Thanks. Yeah, so um, I believe it was in uh, 2019 uh, that Director Wick, um, my boss, uh, Tennis Wick, um, canceled several events uh, because of fire conditions and because of the hazards that are associated with that. Um, we do reserve that kind of um, ability to cancel um, things because of fire conditions. Okay, okay, that's good. But yeah. Thus, uh, but I would note that thus far that has not been interpreted to include red flag events, just mm -hmm. um, active fires. Okay. Okay, um, Jill. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I'm very happy that you're planning to uh, request permits on a variety of events that would impact the public that have not been, uh, where permits have not been required previously. But I am concerned that you're making these permits ministerial. Large events um, uh, should have, I, I would think, uh, some public input. And the I believe that it's the, our local coastal plan requires that a use permit or a CDP uh, is required for an event that has significant impacts on both public access and coastal resources. So it, it seems to me that the public should have some input. And when you make these permits ministerial, like for example, the upcoming King Ridge bike race um, is gonna put 500 bicycles on the coast um, and on River Road, uh, for a significant period of time, uh, it seems like that will have really significant impacts on both public access and coastal resources. Um, and by making it ministerial and making these other uh, uh, events that you are requiring permits for, making them ministerial takes them away from out of uh, the, re the opportunity for the public to weigh in and the communities involved to have some input before these permits are, are issued. And um, as I said, I, it seems to me the regulations on the CDP or the use permit is required when an event would have significant impacts on both public access and coastal resources. And, and uh, I'd like your, your, your response to that. Yeah, as I mentioned previously, the California Coastal Commission has a very, uh, based on our conversations with them, has a very high bar on when a special event would um, would be considered a impediment to coastal access uh, that would require a you know a permit, um, a coastal development permit. Um, you know, there's a uh, argument to be made that uh, you know. By having these kinds of events, it brings more people to the coast um, and allows people to enjoy coastal resources in an important and different way. Um, and the Coastal Commission um, has not, you know, has uh, in, you know, in our understanding and in, uh, in our conversations with the Coastal Commission has invoked uh, the uh, a coastal development permit one time um, since 1997. So uh, it's, we haven't found that to be something that is consistent with the California Coastal Commission's uh, interpretation of the Coastal Act. 
No, but I was I was referring to the local coastal plan uh, that that requires this kind of input, public input. Uh, yeah. I, again, you know, we like based on the coastal commission's definition of coastal access and the what would be an impediment to coastal access. Um, we currently do not view um, these as meeting a coastal um, a, a coastal permit, and they are getting a uh, you know, a special events encroachment permit or a cultural permit um, for, you know, uh, things that are outside of the, um, outside of the right of way. If there are way stations or, uh, you know, lunch stops, those, you know, uh, those kinds of things. Well, I, I, I'm, it sounds to me like you're uh, limiting this to the actual access to the beaches, but if people want to come to the beach on a Sunday, which is when this King Ridge uh, bike event is happening, they're going to have a very difficult time getting there with 500 bikes on River Road. Um, and so that seems to me to have a major impact on the residents, on the weekenders who are trying to maybe leave and can't leave. Um, it, it, and uh, that seems to, as I said, it seems to have a major impact beyond just access to the beach itself. It's access to the roads that lead to the beach where the public, those are the only arteries the public can use if they want to get to the beach or, or leave the beach once they're there. Thanks for your input, Jill. We have a lot of people asking with their hands up to ask questions. So let's move on if we can. Okay, Jenny. Uh, thank you for this presentation. It's uh, Bradley, very informative, and it's good to know that the county uh, is uh, looking at um, upgrading the process and providing the calendar, which I think will be very useful um, for um, for everybody involved. I am thinking just as a a problem that I foresee happening, even with any threshold that is established for this ministerial permit or what have you, is that other groups that are just under the limit may decide to schedule um, an event in the same day for the same location. And I don't think this process would um, prevent that from happening, even though um, there's the calendar. In other words, they may say, well, that's a great event. We don't need to uh, pay to participate. We can organize a group and kind of piggyback on that event, thereby um, eliminating the threshold limit for the group that does organize to get a permit. I see the possibilities of the, the threshold limit not being, no matter how, where it's established, um, especially, you know, at 250 say, that some bicycle events can get really huge. So um, I just wanted to express that concern that uh, no matter what the limit is that is agreed upon or established, there could be ways that people would work around that. Yeah, I mean, anytime you create a law, um, there are people that, uh, you know, try to, um, you know, find loopholes or evade, uh, you know, the requirements of those laws. Um, I still think it's a worthwhile proposition. And one of the things, one of the reasons why we're very focused on um, process improvements and ways that we can make the permitting process faster um, and uh, less expensive is so that it's uh, cheap and easy to get a permit that hopefully encourages people to, um, you know, not try to evade permit requirements and to participate in the process. Um, the easier that we can make it um, for folks to, you know, have a permit to go through the notification process to work with us collaboratively uh, on routes and safety, um, that's uh, one more person that will participate in the process rather than try to evade it. Um, so uh, we, but we are definitely 
um, thinking about uh, evasion. And uh, that's why we're considering multiple thresholds for um, that would trigger a permit rather than just one threshold, uh, because we, we want to make sure that we're capturing those events that should be captured. There was nothing from another group deciding to do the same, uh, a, a bicycle, or let's use that example, a bicycle ride the same day, the same time with a smaller group of people, even though there was this other event happening simultaneously, right? There's nothing in the process so far that would catch that. Do you mean a two groups that because require a permit? They're or two too groups? small to be permitted. Well, I mean, a, a small, a smaller group that didn't require a permit could decide to have that same kind of a ride that day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, groups that are smaller than the permit requirements could decide to, um, you know, uh, go to the beach on the same day, just as um, I could get together with. Uh, several of my friends down in San Francisco and a uh, caravan up to the coast, uh, while other people also caravan to the coast from Santa Rosa or different locations, and that can create traffic. Um, you know, Sonoma Coast is beautiful and lots of people want to, uh, you know, be there. Um, so, so Bradley, I think um, what Jenny is emphasizing again and again is that you should take that into consideration as you develop your guidelines. And Jill, did you have another comment? Yes, I'm concerned about the five-year permit. Um, and if there's, if you're going to put into that permit an opportunity for public feedback after year one or year two, or because it's quite conceivable that an event that looks good on paper to you turns out to be an abomination and yet then they have a five-year permit and there's no public uh, input. So uh, I, I would like to just clarify that they are not five-year permits. Um, they're date reservations. And so they would have to come back to Permit Sonoma um, and work through the entire process with TPW, CHP, um, to make sure that these events are held safely. And, um, you know, we are, we have been told uh, by, by members of the public that, um, you know, poorly uh, behaving events uh, could be a problem. So we are considering different ways um, to uh, consider, to consider that, but these are reservations. They are not five-year permits. Good, that's good to know. I have another just quick question. Jill, Jill we have a lot of people in line and so we need okay. to get through everyone once before we go back again. Okay. Thank you. And I see on the attendee panel, uh, I think uh, C. Higgins has a comment. Uh, yes, how much time do I have? Two minutes. You'll have two minutes and I'll bring the clock up at 30 seconds remaining. Okay. Thank you. Um, Bradley, I do recommend on that memo that you pay more attention to section three on page two, which talks about events that will have potential for adverse impacts to coastal resources. Coastal resources includes public access, do require a discretionary permit. And if you review carefully the sections of our local coastal plan regarding principally permitted uses in each one of the zoned areas, they also say that anything that could impact or be held in areas of, that are environmentally sensitive would once again require a discretionary permit. So my concern here is that you are trying to supplant the existing regulations that protect our coast, which is governed differently. And if you're using this memo as your justification to turn everything ministerial, I suggest you reread that memo and there will be many different individuals that live here on the coast and have worked. I mean, welcome, you are here, you are new. Maybe you don't realize our history of why our coast looks the way it does. It's because there have been people who have been working with the local coastal plan, working with the commission to protect it so that it stays this way. And so we will all be happily talking to the commission about your interpretation of what they are saying that you can suddenly turn all of these events into ministerial only. That is in direct contrast with even the memo that you were quoting, and it's in direct contrast with the ordinances that exist 
in our local coastal plan. So I suggest we look at this again, that there is more discussion around this because events at the coast should not be ministerial only. Thank you. Okay, Jill, did you have another short comment? Um, uh, yes, I did. I, you told us the agencies that you'd be working with and you didn't mention state parks. And I know this bike event at King Road is gonna go through state park property, which is also environmentally sensitive. And I'm wondering if you include state parks in the agencies that you'll be working with to grant these permits, if the event is going to uh, in, be through a state park. Uh, we have not reached out to state parks yet, uh, but we can do so. Thank you for the suggestion. Okay. Uh, Brian, do you have a uh, comment? Yeah, just, I mean, this is all sort of blending in with the King Ridge stuff, which is coming up next. But uh, um, right. uh, I think there is some uh, line that needs to be make sure that folks, that there's a difference between the larger events, which do require permitting in terms of if they're not rules of the road rides, so versus the cycling permits, which are rules of the road, which means they're not closing down roads, which means that they have to, they're subject to the vehicle code. Um, so there is a distinction between those larger events, which do shut down roads. So that's all. Okay. Well, thank you, Bradley. And um, I hope you'll uh, stay with us while we discuss the next item on our agenda which is the King Ridge Supreme uh, Bicycle event on March 27th of this year. I'm happy to stay. Okay, thank you. Um, I apologize uh, for the fact that uh, information about this pending bicycle um, event that is expecting four to 500 bicycles um, on March 27th which is a Sunday, is not in our packet. So people may have been unaware of it. Um, uh, between the two of us, uh, Brian and I will uh, try to describe uh, this event. Uh, we just um, recently obtained the uh, permit application for the event and uh, the uh, permit is going to be issued next Thursday. So we don't have time to comment on it. And I assume from what Bradley has said that it's a ministerial uh, permit anyway, because it doesn't involve closing the roads. Um, but we'd like to discuss it today anyway for uh, the benefit of uh, Brian's uh, land use committee and the work that they'll be doing on uh, commenting on uh, uh, these kinds of uh, events. Brian, do you have anything you'd like to add to that introduction? Um, yeah, and then I, I don't know if, if Jason or if somebody can put up the map might be helpful for folks yeah. if, who are on as well. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think this is, as as uh, Marty mentioned that we got this, um, I wanna say sometime in last week. So it was been sort of short notice in terms of, you know, how we can uh, shine a light on, on, on this event, which is coming up in March. Um, and then, oh, there's the map. Um, so it does go along uh, Highway 1 for uh, a period just south of Stewart's Point and then uh, just north of um, Jenner, which is obviously um, just north of Jenner, you're obviously going to see uh, there's a, all those windy uh, descents. So that's going to be, um, I would imagine that would be pretty dramatic um, uh, delays possible when you're driving through on, um, on the road. So that is something that folks will want to consider. Um, but so this event is kind of interesting in that it has two different routes in the same event, one which is longer than the other. And uh, you'll notice if uh, Jason will scroll up that um, the longer event includes everything in the shorter event, 
plus a little um, loop to the south of Duncan's Mills added on to the longer event to make it longer. Um, and they are proposing that um, all the bicyclists remain on their side of the road. So it doesn't involve uh, right. closing the road. And they right. say they will provide uh, an emergency ve vehicle with two EMTs in it uh, following the pack of bicyclists. Um, Do you have anything else to add, well, Brian? Uh, um, I don't have anything else, but if it, you know, I just wanted to make sure that, that folks knew about it. And then, you know, if anybody had some questions or wanted to comment about it. So um, panelist questions, um, Beth and then uh, Scott Farmer and then Paul Placos and then Jill. Okay, Beth. Thank you, Marty. Um, so this, is, this ride to me is quite concerning. Uh, I want to preface that I was a very active cyclist for many years, uh, and I have great empathy for the cycling community and understand the desire to participate in these events. Uh, this will be a monumental impact on our coast and access to the coast. And the reality of, of this is, this is going to be hurting the, the group that everyone talks about wanting to protect the marginalized, though that uh, those that have uh, lesser incomes, because they're who come out on your off season weekends. They can, in particularly in certain communities, Sundays are their days to go to the beach, and this will have a significant impact on them. Uh, the this ride is going to be going through the uh, Williams Creek area, and I'm sorry, Willow Creek area, and it's gonna be taking a fire trail that was not meant for wet weather use. And who knows what a uh, end of March day is gonna be like out here. The biosensitive habitat, and it, it's a wonderful area uh, for salmon spawning. And, and it's just deeply concerning to me that the access that these cyclists are gonna have to, to this area in mass. Uh, where are they gonna go to the bathroom? Mm. Two potty breaks? That's not appropriate. To, uh, as a cyclist, when you have to go, usually you have to go. And as a cattle rancher, I can tell you, I know exactly where they're gonna go. They're gonna go along the side of somebody's fields, somebody's yard. 500 cyclists, it's a massive event. Uh, I, this, this all concerns me considerably and there's no way they're not gonna block traffic. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Uh, Scott? Beth just uh, <clears throat> talked about my uh, subject. Since it's a ministerial application, it's about the boxes that get checked. And um, I was gonna also say what Beth said about um, the lack of toilets. I know at least one that's a state parks restroom that's not on the route that's been locked for two years. Um, if that were open and made available and placed on the uh, cyclist map, we'd solve one problem in one location. Um, and the, the state park road, is a it's a county road going through the state park, but it is unpaved. Very gentle, it's a perfect place to ride to the ridges. It was built for stagecoaches, but um, um, toilets, thanks. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Paul Playcoast and then Jill. Sure, um, you know, we were talking about this isn't an event of, of road closure, but I think it really matters as to what your definition of road closure is. There's two places along Highway 1 where four to 500 bicyclists are going to be going southbound. And I would defy anybody to, uh, to go through there safely driving a car, you know, by four to 500 bicyclists. So I, I think this is a real problem. Uh, and even within the document that I've, I have read, um, it talks about how uh, this organization is 
um, encouraging CHP to be there, it's not quantified. It doesn't say CHP is going to be here from this time to this time with so many people, you know, with so many officers. This is not right. And uh, there's going to be accidents, unfortunately. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Jill? You're muted. Jill, you're muted. Jill, you're muted. Yeah, I'm sorry. I wanted to uh, echo what, what both Paul and, and uh, Beth have said and add to the point that I, I do think that this uh, a permit is a kind of a workaround. Instead of actually closing the road, putting four or 500 bikes on the road, there's no, most people will not pass bicycles on a narrow road. And so effectively you've closed the road. All you need is one driver ahead of you. And these are prime, you know, I don't think that um, Bradley, you may appreciate the fact that these are primary roads. There's no secondary roads. If I want, as a resident of Jenner of Muniz Ranches, if I want to go into town, I have to, there's no other routes other than Highway One, River Road. Um, and, and, you know, it, so it's, I like that you say in the future, you're going to give a calendar out, but that means that the road is effectively closed. Um, and uh, I think that permits uh, should not be granted on primary roads where there are no ability for locals or uh, weekenders or tourists to take alternative routes. There are no alternative routes. And I think it's a terrible imposition on the road to allow 500 bicycles uh, to, to carry on. And that's my first point. My second point is that I read their application and it says the bike race ends at the gate of Willow Creek uh, Park. But the, but the race starts in, in uh, Duncan's Mills. How are people going to get, how are 500 bicyclists going to get from the end of the, of the race at Willow Creek back to Duncan's Mills other than put 500 bicycles on that eight mile route at the same time that people who have been day using the coast are trying to go home again, it's gonna be a nightmare, a nightmare. Thank you, Jill. Um, Jason, I don't see any hands raised. My hands yeah. raised again. Uh, but sorry. we do have Paul, Paul has a comment. Okay. Yeah, just one more comment, and that is uh, the whole check-in process. Uh, they check in very early, up until 8.30, and then in the document, it indicates that the race starts between 9, Not it's not a race, the ride starts between 9 and 9.45, but people that have been there checking in until 8.30, everyone's going to start at 9. They're not going to space themselves out. Okay, and I'm gonna take Jenny next because she has not yet made a comment about this. Thank you very much. The, the more I listen and the more I hear about this uh, upcoming event, the more scared I'm getting. If there is any emergency during the time when this event is planned, um, it will just be the, the only way to get somebody to a hospital will have to go out by helicopter because it will be, I live very close to route one, even on the weekends during good weather, even, you know, even in the winter, you can get massive traffic jams, which prevent you from uh, traveling at any normal speed to get just to the post office. So, be aware that this is an accident and uh, waiting to happen. And um, uh, it should be rethought if possible. Thank you. Thank you. There are two attendees um, who have comments they'd like to make and all of the panelists have, who have their hands raised have already made a comment. So I'm gonna take C. Higgins and Liz Gallagher. And each of you will have two minutes. Hello again. Um, 
I am your audience this evening, your commenting one. Um, I just want to say that the assumption that this is a ministerial permit is a false assumption. If you are going to have 500 plus bikers using public coastal road roadways and Willow Creek Trail, an environmentally fragile and sensitive area within state parks, and the salmon bearing Willow Creek watershed, which it's already crumbling downhill course. It's completely inappropriate. It's going to have negative impacts to ESHA. And this requires a coastal development permit. Now a coastal development permit isn't saying that an event like this can't occur. What it's saying is that it requires a certain level of review to see what those impacts are and to present mitigations and to have a public process. And so I am just appalled that the county is taking the position that this is a ministerial permit because it is not. And I think that we all need to contact the Coastal Commission immediately to let them know that the county is considering having this event without doing the proper permitting. Thank you. This is an important question for Bradley to address. Yeah, through, uh, through the chair, I'm happy to address uh, some of these uh, concerns that have been brought up. Um, so uh, as, as I've stated earlier, um, the Coastal Commission uh, has a quite high bar for what they consider to be something that bars coastal access. Um, they also only consider coastal permits for special events that occur between Memorial Day and Labor Day. Um, as uh, per their memo. Um, so, and the interpretation that they gave us in our meetings with them. So um, yeah, uh, that, that addresses the, the Coastal Commission issue. Um, I, you know, I, I would just say that, um, you know, I, I look, I, um, you know, work on this project and, you know, we are going to be, um, you know, working to establish, uh, you know, different um, mechanisms that hopefully improve special events, um, you know, establishing standards that can be applied, um, you know, through this ministerial process, um, you know, having a certain number of bathroom breaks uh, per, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, per distance is something that uh, we can consider in that kind of standardization process. Uh, that that intergovernmental committee would work on. Um, but I, I, I would just say that, you know, with this process, um, you know, bicycles have a right under the California Vehicle Code to ride on the road and roads must be shared with bicycles. And so when people are saying that one bicycle uh, slows down and creates a traffic jam, like uh, the California Vehicle Code, you know, we, we can limit encroachments, but the California Vehicle Code, you know, does provide the rights for bicyclists to use the resources and, you know, the, you know, um, it, it uh, and I do think it's a little, um, yeah, it, as, as somebody that, uh, you know, has seen bicyclists produce zero carbon, um, and, you know, it, it's interesting to me to see people argue that, um, you know, that cars driving through, you know, should be able to drive through unfettered, but bicyclists are creating, um, you know, all sorts of pollution that is, is deeply hazardous. I, I find that um, an interesting argument. Um, so, uh, like I said, this is a ministerial process. We've worked with C, uh, um, I, uh, my understanding, and I have not processed this permit, um, but talking with the team is that they have been in contact with CHP. Um, you know, these are state roads uh, that Caltrans, you know, and we do contact Caltrans uh, about closure or about uh, events on state roads and um, do listen to feedback that they give us on those state roads. Um, so uh, where they do have jurisdiction. Um, so those are just the comments that I have. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, some of these issues can be addressed in the larger permitting process, uh, that reform process that we had talked about earlier. Um, in the meeting, um, things like the bathrooms, which can be established as standards. Um, so uh, the input is is useful, and I appreciate it. Okay, Liz Gallagher. Oh, that one, one more thing before uh, uh, we we have also sent out um, the route and 
um, the permitting to the local fire districts um, and uh, you know first responders um, asking for comments before we certify uh, or before we issue any permit. So um, in terms of medical response, um, you know, I think that that is, uh, you know, that's something that we have, you know, talked to the fire districts about. Okay, thank you. Uh, Liz Gallagher. Go ahead, Liz. Unmute yourself. Liz, can you unmute okay. yourself? Uh, I, I got it now. So what I'm having an, a problem with understanding is um, when did it uh, happen that we have to have, uh, or cyclists need I'm not hearing you. Are, are you having technical problems, Liz? Internet. Yes. Oh. I think Liz must be having internet issues. I think so. And Liz, you could type your, um, your question or comment to the Q&A if, if, uh, if that would help. That's apparently not working either. So um, Carolyn Madden. Yeah, Bradley, when will the residents get notified of this bike race? And they it doesn't sound like they get any input into the process at all. Is this true? So uh, the event has, to my knowledge, gone up on our calendar. Um, obviously, uh, you know, it has been referred to here um, so that and folks are discussing it here. But these are ministerial permits as currently constructed. And so um, ministerial permits uh, are not um, discretionary permits. Um, a discretionary permit is one where uh, a judgment is made based on, um, you, you know, uh, you know, where judgment is made based on, uh, you know, different factors about granting a permit or not granting a permit, rather than um, kind of a, uh, a checklist in terms of different, um, you know, thresholds that have to be reached. Um, so, for example, uh, there's a difference between, um, you know, you know, uh, you know uh, building and uh, changing zoning um, that uh, to build a new building versus uh, putting up a, a fence on your own property, kind of um, uh, think about that as uh, the kind of difference in the permitting types. Okay, um, Beth, Jill, and Jenny, do your comments differ uh, oh, wait. substantively from what other people have already asked? Uh, I have. Um, one quick question that's different than I need to read into the record of comments someone asked me to read in for them. Okay, thanks. Okay, so my question, Bradley, is who's going to pay for the upstaffing of the CHP and our EMS? Um, it, this will require all of our local volunteer and professional firefighters to upstaff in case there is a significant accident, which is very reasonable. One car going the wrong way, you've got 70 cyclists down. So who pays for that up staffing? Bradley, I so, think that was a question for yeah, you. Yeah, no, no, uh, I was finding my unmute button. I oh, okay. Um, so uh, yeah, my, my mouse had gone astray. Um, the, so CHP and fire districts uh, often seek to recoup costs from permittees. Um, I have not been engaged in discussions on this particular permit, um, but I do know that CHP, when assigning officers on overtime, does um, you know uh, seek to recoup costs from the permittees. Okay, thank you. So now I'm going to read a letter that was sent to me to be read as a comment. Okay. Okay. Um, and this is from a, uh, a 
D. Swanhauser. I can't attend the CMAC meeting. I'm hoping that Beth can forward this email to all CMAC members and consider this my public comment opposing the cycling event. Let's figure out how to get the fire department another way. I love cyclists, equestrians, and hikers of all abilities and helped get them 120 miles of, Nor of Bay Area Ridge Trail, miles in the four North Bay counties when I was the North Bay Ridge Trail director. This one event scale and surely the intent of the organizers to do it annually doesn't fit with our fragile coastal ec ecosystem or the lives of our diminishing local residents. When does CEQA come to bear on this type of, this, of situation? If it's successfully successful financially, will it become annual and grow in size? Is this a cumulative effect? It may also inspire other like type events. How many large events does the coast have to endure already? We have to consider the overall financial obligations it will put on our citizens of all economic abilities and inabilities. Then also add in that local residents are again crowded out from going to the coast for the r, &R they need on their days off. It is becoming a fast in deal with you know who, D. Swanheiser. I believe that's the, the devil would be the you know who. Thank you, Beth. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jenny, do you have one more comment before we close this out? Uh, yes, I, I think there's been a lot of really good discussion about this issue. And um, what my question is, is there seems to be different interpretations of what is, uh, who makes the decision on what is ministerial permit and not. And I'd like to know who the person is in the county. Is it only Bradley that is making this decision or are there a group of uh, our elected officials who have made this decision, who make this interpretation to, which seems to contradict what most of the people on the CMAC have been discussing. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh... Uh, I, I hate to, uh, you know, downplay my own uh, great power here, uh, but I, I make very few decisions. Um, so in 1994, uh, there was an update to the special events regulations uh, that were promulgated first in 1987. Um, under that update, um, you know, it, you know, it's, uh, Article 16. Um, so you guys can, I can send that um, along with um, the, uh, the memo from the Coastal Commission uh, to Elise, and she can uh, send that on to everybody if that would be helpful. Um, but that governs uh, the current permit regime um, that has been ministerial since the 1990s. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that's the process that has existed um, for you know, since the 49ers last won the Super Bowl. Um, the uh, current reform process uh, will go first to the Planning Commission, and then it will go to the um, Board of Supervisors, um, is my understanding of the process for um, approval, and members of the Board of Supervisors would need to adopt um, a ordinance change in order to change the current process. Uh, but the current process is ministerial and uh, that was adopted in the 90s, and um, we are currently not proposing a change to that. Okay, thank you. Um, I think this will close out discussion of this issue. And Bradley, um, you'll be hearing from our land use committee uh, in uh, late February after they meet. I think their meeting is on the 22nd of February. And I, I also want to thank you, Bradley. And um, I will, I'll send you an email as well for some of the comments as well.
Thank Great. you. Great. No, thank you so much, everybody, for the spirited discussion and um, the the feedback. It's very, very useful as we um, you know move forward in this process, um, making sure that uh, we're hearing from a wide variety of voices. Um, you know, uh, yeah. So uh, really appreciate everyone's time and uh, willingness to engage with me this evening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I noticed that Linda Hopkins has joined us. So Linda, um, can you uh, give us uh, your update now? Yes, thank you so much. Thank um, you. For example. And you know, I wanted to start off by saying thank you so much to Chair Emeritus Scott Farmer um, for his leadership with the Coastal Mac. And I um, just wanted to take a few moments to sort of thank you and share some of my thoughts on your leadership. Um, over the past couple of years, you know, I really feel, Scott, that you were able to take community engagement on the coastal MAC to an entirely new level, which is extremely impressive, given that you chaired the MAC during the pandemic, which was a time at which we needed more community engagement and our communities were more fragmented than ever before. I also want to acknowledge that you did a lot more than just chair the meetings and, um, you know, make sure that they ran smoothly and, and be the formal chair of the MAC. You also took that role really seriously and you showed up to countywide meetings to express coastal concerns and to take notes to bring them back to the Municipal Advisory Council. And you really were a critical sort of conveyor of information back and forth between different government agencies and between the MAC itself and then also the communities. I also want to thank you for the role that you assumed in really being, I think, the convener that the North Coast needed at this point in time, right? The North Coast is fiercely independent, notoriously so, deservedly so, and your ability to bring together disparate groups of people and to share information back and forth was really, truly a gift that I am very grateful for. And, um, you know, the, I, I want to thank you also for the fantastic meetings, um, speaking of convening and your gift at convening, that Elise and I were able to attend on Tuesday. Thank you so much for working with our office to create an entire North Coast Day. And I also want to thank um, Chair Campbell and um, Council Member um, Placos for participating in those meet some of those meetings as well. And to give everyone else who wasn't at those meetings sort of a little brief highlight, um, I just want to sort of share some of the top concerns that I heard. I heard a lot of the concerns regarding the long-term financial viability of North Coast Fire Departments, um, which is something that we plan to actively work on. Also heard a lot about the need for affordable housing and senior services. Of course, um, broadband and connectivity and evacuation safety is also always top of mind. And so we have a number of follow-ups planned. And I want to give sort of a brief um, you know, kind of overview of some of those follow-ups. We were going to be working on scheduling a meeting with Senator McGuire about the CAL FIRE bill that will require a minimum of three staffing on CAL FIRE engines, which could potentially negatively impact local fire agencies who are currently contracting with CAL FIRE for a rate of two staff people per fire engine. So it could actually sort of push, unfortunately, some of those entities into insolvency. Um, we also um, heard, we also, also scheduled a meeting for, um, to come up with uh, Dave Kiff and Paul Dunaway, who is our Division Director of um, Adults and Aging Division of Human Services. And Dave Kiff is our Community Development Commission um, Executive Director. And we wanted to get some of these county officials up to the North Coast to hear directly and to work directly with the organizations who are concerned about both affordable housing and senior services. Um, we are also going to be um, I already did follow up with Gary Helfrich about affordable housing and sort of what we've been having conversations with the Coastal Commission and the local coastal plan and also looking forward for um, potential funding opportunities for affordable housing. Now, now sort of changing directions a little bit, but also with still some North Coast news, I did want to provide a brief update on um, our community investment funds and tourism impact funds. We will have a, a second round of funding going out soon and moving forward through the CAO's office to the Board of Supervisors to be ratified. That will include a recommendation from our office for funding for Timber Cove's rescue equipment, as well as the Coastal Hills application, both of which were discussed at those North Coast meetings. Also, we're gonna be moving forward with funding a CHP contract for additional parking enforcement. So I wanna give a huge thanks to everyone who participated in the parking ad hoc and the parking conversations, along with the Lower Russian River MAC. Um, also very exciting news for the South Coast, which is that um, on Tuesday, the Board of Supervisors is poised to approve $3 million a year for Bodega Bay Fire Protection District to consolidate with Sonoma County Fire District. 
And so that is a really big deal to have stabilized um, sort, of, sort of the South Coast emergency fire services and medical services needs. And I look forward now to being able to sort of turn more attention, hopefully once that's across the finish line, um, really to the needs of the North Coast into the future. Also wanted to let everyone know that vegetation management funding round two is moving forward. So please do let your fire safe groups and your local fire agencies know that that is general fund dollars available through the County of Sonoma. And we can put you in touch with the staff members at the Ag Preservation and Open Space District who are sort of working on those projects and um, so you can get more information, ask questions, and also walk you through the application process. So those are my um, updates, but I wanna just give you know one more shout out. Thank you so much, Scott, for everything that you did to lead the Coastal Municipal Advisory Council. And thank you so much, Chair Campbell, for stepping into the role and look forward to your leadership um, shine over the next year. So really, really appreciate working with all of you. And I really feel like we're in a good and exciting place as a Municipal Advisory Council where you know, we're really providing critical feedback in real time to county decisions that are going to ultimately impact where you live. So thank you all so much for engaging and for sticking with us. And Scott, thank you so much for your leadership. Back to you, Chair Campbell. Oh, uh, thank, thank you for kind words. <laughs> Go ahead, Marty. Well, you can, you can go ahead. No, that's it. Just thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks everybody. Your so, thanks are well-deserved. Um, moving on, the next item on the agenda is the Water Ad Hoc Committee Report, followed by the Land Use Committee Report, and I think both of these are from Brian. All right, sorry about that, it was a mute. Um, um, okay, so for the Water Ad Hoc Committee, uh, we actually do not have an official chair for that yet. And if anybody would like to join that, so if any of the new folks would like to join that, please contact me. Um, uh, we have, we've just, you know, just scratched the surface, so we could definitely have somebody else uh, join. If, if you're interested in water sustainability, which is obviously an important question on, uh, on the coast. Um, so we did have one meeting in December uh, where we discussed uh, uh, how to get the information on the local water systems, uh, building a database for, for that information, and then um, making sure with all of our back members. So we will be sending you all an email just to make sure that we have all the water districts um, that you know of on the coast as well to make sure we're not missing any. Um, and then hopefully, uh, sort of down the road, we're hoping to get some sort of uh, panel together for a future MAC meeting um, to, to for the um, some of the water uh, the water officials, some of the representatives of water agencies to uh, to join us for a discussion of um, their plans for water sustainability and um, sort of crisis management in case we do run out of water in any of our communities. So I think that's for the that's it for the water ad hoc. Um, and if anybody has any questions, feel free to contact me or anybody else who's on that committee. And if you would like to be on that committee, please let me know. Um, I would like maybe not to be doing both of the committees. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have anything else to add for the land use committee report? Uh, yeah, just do it real quick. We did have a special meeting. Um, our meeting was, uh, our, our normal scheduled meeting would be right, it was right around uh, Christmas time. So we delayed that. And then we had a special meeting to discuss the uh, Timber Cove Country Inn project, which is uh, in the permitting process. Um, and then thank you for folks who joined us for that with uh, who, um, we had a little issue with the Zoom, but we were able to, to go forward with that. Um, and then, um, for that, for that project up in Timber Cove, there are still uh, several opportunities for community members to comment on it, both to permit Sonoma and then other agencies that will also be issuing permits for that. Um, and then the King Ridge bicycle event, which uh, I think we discussed plenty today. Yeah, thank you. So does anybody have any questions? Um, for Brian about those uh, two committees. I don't see any hands. Um, Scott? 
real quick. Um, there's a room for another person. We kind of held it open for um, uh, if there was an issue that a local person, but it's up to Brian, but if he wants to put a call out for a fourth person on the land use committee, it might be the time to try that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and we do, we have, right now we have, Beth and I are from the south half, and so if anybody from, especially from the north coast is interested in joining as well, please uh, let me know. And then also for the for the water hack ad hoc as well, if you'd like to join that. It's a great opportunity. And then uh, for the committees, uh, I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Marty or Scott, that I believe alternates can also do the committees. Yes, yes, alternates can be on the committees as well. So if you'd like to get more involved, please uh, let me or or Marty know and be happy to get you more involved. I, we okay. have work for you to do. Okay, I saw Jill Lippitt's hand go up and go down. I was gonna volunteer for the land use committee, but I can email Brian. Okay, thank Great. you. So um, let's see, do, in, do any of the other council members have any comments? Scott again? Yeah, um, actually, uh, Annie Crestwell, I, she's having problems with her internet. She was, uh, and I met with um, Transportation Public Works to talk about the Annapolis yard uh, and trying to get it open. And there's a um, mm -hmm. petition out. And I just, she was gonna just say that we met it's very um, productive. She's getting a lot of information back. We've actually CHCP um, and uh, the sheriff, and, and they've um, also responded to some signage that we've asked, mile markers, and they um, made an audit of those and replacement. The point is, is that um, we're in a very good uh, relation, um, dialogue right now. Um, that's it. Okay, thanks. And Beth? Um, Marty, can I jump in because I want to respond to Scott's comment. Beth, is, I'm uh -huh. assuming you're, you have a different one. Mm -hmm. um, the question on the Annapolis Yard is really fascinating, but I want to talk about, um, we've been going back and forth about, is it cost effective? Is it not cost effective to have the Annapolis Yard open? And one of the concerns that we have is, is that, uh, you know, we set guidelines for county departments and then they need to manage their budget and their way of doing things so going down and trying to drill down into how transportation and public works gets things done is is really um you know inappropriate from our direction but the so what we tried to do was to back off the questions which is to say why do you want the Annapolis yard open what are the questions that you have what are the problems that are not being addressed? And so we talked about speeding in particular spots, signage that wasn't available in certain spots, road maintenance that was not available in certain spots. And, and we found out from talking with the representatives as well as CHP and TPW that a lot of those issues hadn't been being raised because people were saying, oh, the Annapolis yard isn't here. We don't have any way to get these things fixed. But Transportation and Public Works and CHP is still addressing these issues. So what we did was we then went through each of those issues. And within three days, I think, of our meeting, our signage people were up there from Transportation and Public Works and re replaced the mile marker signs and put up the signs that were being requested. CHP agreed to put people on uh, speed uh, patrol in those particular speed areas that we had that were identified as dangerous areas. And were, um, we asked for more input and photos uh, specifically saying where they had road maintenance issues so that we could get the maintenance teams up there. So the question really is, um, I think the appropriate question isn't, we have to get the Annapolis Yard open. The question is, what are the issues we need to fix and how do we go about fixing them in the best way possible? And working collaboratively with Transportation Public Works and CHP, you know, rather than trying to drill down and say, well, how are you using your budget at this time of year and how many miles are being driven and exactly how much gas time is being used. It's, that's, that's really micromanaging a major department. And um, so we're trying to take a different approach, which is what are the challenges and how can we meet the maintenance challenges and get the information from the community on what needs to be fixed so that we can address address fixing things um, rather than spending our time just going back and forth about that one 
possible route to a solution. Okay, thank you, Elise. Thank you, Elise. That's exactly right. And I see uh, Beth and Wanda with their hands up and we still have uh, the staff report to get through. And I'd really like to end this meeting by eight o'clock, which is 10 minutes. So Beth and Wanda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marty. Uh, as uh, I believe it was C. Higgins brought up, there was yet another accident in the town of Bodega. Um, this, uh, it was yesterday, I believe, and it, uh, somebody fell asleep uh, speeding and on their, their way home from work, I believe. Um, and it could have been tragic. It could have plowed into a home if they hadn't, if the, uh, the sign they took out, um, you know, hadn't stopped them. This is the third accident in this stretch of roadway just in the last few months. I, I don't know what the solution is. I'd like the opportunity to uh, meet with someone from the roads department and perhaps Elise as well. And uh, with a, in a couple of key players in the town of, of Bodega, how do we go about doing that? I'll set it up, Beth. Thank you. Thank you, Elise. Thank you. And Wanda. Okay, thank you. Um, I unmuted. Yeah. Um, I just want to jump on the bandwagon of accolades for Scott Farmer. Um, you know, Scott, you've just been incredible at this job. And not only, um, you know, were you just a great chair, but you were involved in like every issue possible on the coast and, and you um, forming committees. I'm um, just, you know, always having time for um, at least all my nosy questions. So um, anyway, just appreciate it and, and wanted everyone to hear that. Um, also, I'd like to say I am appreciating Sonoma County. Um, uh, I wasn't at the last meeting and I just want to acknowledge that um, you now I'm, uh, some of you don't know me. I can't <laughs> wait until we get to meet in person um, again someday, hopefully soon. But, um, but I'm in the Fort Ross district. So that's, um, you know, Fort Ross road between Casadero and like Myers grade and kind of northward from there. And uh, a local nonprofit was awarded um, a, a grant through the county um, for fuel uh, reduction. And so Fort Ross Road, um, that will be, the project will be getting completed uh, this year for fuel reduction along the road. And we're all very excited and very grateful. We also got a chipper that is now being used in the community. Um, so that's just wonderful. And um, what else did I wanna say? There was one other thing. Um, oh, just that uh, lately, We've been working a lot with um, Fire Forward, which is a wonderful group um, that is uh, doing prescribed burns and doing a lot of instruction for you know, people to, to learn about how to do prescribed burns safely. And it's just wonderful to get fire back into our ecosystem. Um, so, um, and that's, uh, I, I think others perhaps on this um, council have, have used them, but um, just wanna say they're a very good organization, Fire Forward. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Brian? Uh, yeah, just real quick. Uh, the Planning Commission is still going through the local coastal uh, plan. So uh, go to the Planning Commission's website and they'll have information about the next. They already did uh, two sections of it. They're going through it by section by section. So please, if you're interested in changes to that, which is coming up, uh, please go ahead and look at the Planning Commission and, and attend those meetings. Thank you, Brian. And I missed the last one. Um, and I understand that they're all recorded too. So if you've missed one of their meetings, you can go find the recording, I assume, on the county's YouTube channel. So um, Elise has told me that um, she's shared her staff report items with Linda and Linda. Um, covered everything. So this is the call for new agenda meeting uh, items for our next meeting. If you have any that you'd like to share with us today, please do so. And otherwise, uh, send an email to uh, Elise and me, um, and uh, we'll uh, get it on the agenda for the next meeting. And I see Scott's hand. 
Yeah, um, uh, Friends of the Wallala River, the Wallala watershed, um, we tried to get them for this meeting. And I think that they'll be in the next meeting on the agenda. Yes, yes, they will. And Beth? Uh, yes, um, Elise, is there an update uh, for uh, our those of, that are listening uh, regarding the Sonoma Marin meeting? Uh, no, there's nothing substantive to report on that. And, uh, and we're now on agenda items. So why don't you and I talk about that another time? Excellent. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay. So um, if nobody has another, uh, Wanda, is your hand still up or up again? You're muted. You're, you're muted, Wanda. There, okay. No, it's yeah. up again. Um, for an agenda item, um, and it wouldn't have to take a long time, but uh, there's sort of a newer organization on the coast, the Coast Collaborative, um, which is involving a lot of, um, well, actually, even now, all the way up from Sea Ranch, all the way down to Bodega, um, that's trying to uh, have a collaborative effort to um, uh, get CAL FIRE funding for, for grants um, involved with, you know, fuel reduction. So, that would be nice to have that. I could um, write something and send it to you to add that to the agenda. Okay, thanks. Sure. Good idea. Okay. Have a nice evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank we, want to, we want to have a motion to adjourn, I'm sorry. Oh, yes. And thank you for the attendees uh, to have attended the meeting. So do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. <laughs> and I need a second. And second. second. Okay. Right. Okay. Now, do I'll, we need to do a roll call? Yeah, I'll just do a quick roll call. Okay. Fast here. Okay. Beth? Aye. Uh, Scott? Aye. Marty? Aye. Paul? Aye. Abby? Aye. Wanda? Aye. Jill? Aye. Brian? Aye. And Ginny? Okay, thank you. It is 7.57 and we are adjourning. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.